In the history of rental cars, nobody ever pulled into Hertz or Avis and said, you know, right? I had the car for three days. I, I drove it through the washer and I, you know, vacuumed out the back seat, right? And, and, and here it is. Has never happened before. Why? Because it's not your car. So if you take that into the work context, right? If we don't give people autonomy, right? We don't give them a sense that they're doing something meaningful. Why would they invest, you know, their, their heart and soul into this and go above and beyond? Thank you for tuning in to Growing Your Business with People, a podcast dedicated to CEOs and other business leaders who are looking to grow their business with their biggest and most important investment, people. Here's your host, Jeff Lackey. Hello, this is Jeff Lackey. Today we have our guest, Thomas Burdells. Thomas is the founder and president of PurposeWorks, a company whose mission is to make work more productive, valuable, and meaningful. He's also author of a book called Fixing Work with co-author David Henkin and is host of the podcast Work Matters, Fix It. Taylorism has led to many companies taking the soul and meaning out of work, and we're going to talk about how to put it back. So thank you very much for joining us today. So Thomas, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you became more passionate about creating meaningful work? Sure, delighted to. Um, yeah, so I started my career uh, in, a, in a large company uh, called Azir Brown Bavari, ABB, a long time ago. And um, after a number of years there, I decided to go into consulting. I got involved in some interesting transformation work at ABB, and I wanted to do more of that. And so I joined a, a small boutique consulting firm called Raz & Strong, which later became part of Aon Consulting, where I really got introduced to like the socio-technical model, right? That actually, as you change an organization and you change the processes and the way work gets done, you got to take the people along the journey and you got to give them ownership for that. Um, so that was really a, a, a revelation for me. And, and so I was there for seven years. I built a I helped build the process improvement design practice there. And then myself and six other colleagues decided to start our own consulting firm called ValeoCon. Uh, and we had a nice 19-year uh, run with that. And about three years ago, I decided to start my own business, um, really based on, I think, the recognition that what I'd seen over the last 25 years in consulting is that you know, obviously all these efforts that you put in uh, to, to fix work processes, to create more effective organizations that, that we really, I think, uh, left like the people's side uh, shortchanged. And, uh, and I think that manifests itself in, in what I call work is broken, right? So you, you get these organizations, I think they're very, you know, globally well-known, uh, well-run company. Um, but what you, when you look actually how the work gets done, you oftentimes find the work is incredibly bureaucratic, incredibly frustrating, and, and people in general are not engaged, right? And we see that in the Gallup surveys, right? 30% of people are engaged. Um, we also have seen it during the pandemic with the, the big quit, right? That a lot of people leave. And so I realized three years ago that there, I think, really is an opportunity um, to fix work and, and to not just fix the processes and, and bring better technology to bear, but also really make work better for people, right? Create more meaningful and, and motivating job. Um, and yeah, it's like my my background, uh, you know, my, my grandfather used to be a stonemason, right? And so when you, when you work with stone, right, you actually see at the end of the day, right, what the outcome of, of, of your work is, right? It's very tangible. Um, and I, I think a lot of jobs nowadays lack that. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's the mission that I set out to make work more productive, valuable, meaningful, and impactful. Hmm. Well, I'd like to ask the folks on the, on the, on the, you know, watching this video right now, how tangible is your work, right? Even if you're CEO or CXO, do you feel like you understand, you know, at the end of the day, did I have a good day or did I have a, you know, did I have a bad day? Like, other than like, hey, maybe I got beat up, you know, in a meeting or I had some frustrating meetings, like really, like what is the what is the sign of success? If you're building a, um, a, a wall, a building or something out of stone, it's very clear if that thing's standing, if it looks beautiful, if it's created in, in a solid structure, it's very clear that that's a that's a successful outcome, right? As CEO, like even you might have difficulty saying like, what does, what does success look like at the end of the day? Right. Uh, 
imagine in, and you're you you run your whole company like imagine what that feels like for the people two three four five seven layers potentially down into your organization and 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 how much of a need there is to connect the work with the purpose so that's what i hear you saying is that we've we've kind of broken things down into all when we talk about taylorism it was like this concept of time motion studies and breaking down the jobs into all the different pieces and trying to create economies out of the fact that um you know we would specialize well we've become so overly specialized that nobody understands or very few people understand what the big picture is and uh and thus it's really taken the soul out of the jobs that people have they don't know they don't know um what the what the end impact really is for people is that is that an accurate framing yeah that's absolutely true I mean, but we've, we've known this for like six decades, right? It goes back to Douglas <laughs> McGregor and, and Frederick Hertzberg, right? Um, what makes a good job and a good job, meaningful work, autonomy and feedback, right? You, knowledge of the results, you know how you're doing. And to your point, in a lot of jobs, right? We don't have, um, we don't have a sense of winning. We don't have a sense of the final outcome, right? We don't have line of sight to the customer. And when the job is done, we we we, right, we really don't don't have a sense for where the work goes. Um, mm. And you know there are all these stories, right, about people, right, who did a job for you know 30, 35 years, right, and, and when they retire, right, they said, you know, as a right as a goodbye gift, could you right maybe show me like how all the work gets done, right? Could you walk me to the factory? I'd like to know what happens next, right? <laughs> and so I think that's very pervasive, and um, and I think it's a design it's a design flaw, right. Um, mm -hmm following this Tayloristic model, that's how we chose to structure work. And we've been repeating sort of the same model for the last right, 70, 80, 90 years. Um, and the issue is just in today's environment is everything becomes much more knowledge driven. Right? Mm -hmm. I think that model increasingly breaks down. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know that even in my organizations, I've, I've, I've struggled creating that, um, you know, and to say, how do you how do you create that line of sight? Uh, one of the things that I used to do was I would uh, I would go on site visits to uh, to see my recruiters off in the field, and before I go, I talk to um, I talk to different customers and say, hey, you know, what are some great examples of where how we won and did some amazing stuff, and also what are some good examples of things that we really need to you know continue working on, right? That you specific things, you know. And and I want to know the people who actually were the you know were the the folks who helped us to succeed. I may not call out the folks who who didn't do so well in the in the group meeting, but certainly recognizing and and cheering on those that helped us to achieve success. And in those meetings, making it very tangible and real for the person, and calling out a specific person, a specific name, a specific project, um, it it got their attention. It was like, okay, this is real. This isn't some like high level fluffy conversation. And then you describe that impact, you know. So, for example, we might have, uh, you know, in some cases, in one case, we had to uh, drive uh, drive um, a huge hiring of customer service agents for a uh, a ramp to go uh, for a welcome season. Uh, in that particular welcome season, we had. Uh, we had a new customer orders that we're putting at, and, and our ability to hire was potentially a $10 billion risk to the company. And so the COO called me up of, uh, of that line of business and said, we really need to do something here to insulate it. And we had the conversation. When I shared that back with the team, they could understand, okay, like I'm not just recruiting for these things. I'm actually... I'm trying to to maintain and, and salvage a ten billion dollar line of business. Like, and so if we have to work a little late, or if we put an extra, get up early and start early morning hours, or if we do extra work on this, and if we decide to push off to the side other projects because of this, we all understand why. Because there's a there's a critical nature of the focus that we're putting on this. And I think that really helped me to uh, to help with that engagement to, the, to your point. So 
that's a that's it's it's super important, but it also takes time. Leaders have to take time to do these things. So that's uh, that's phenomenal. Hello, listeners. As a senior business leader, you're probably struggling with scaling infrastructure like succession, engagement of people, retention, hiring, and even change management. FutureSolve is an HR advisory firm founded with some of the most well-known CHROs in the country. We specialize in helping medium-sized companies and small businesses with their HR strategy. We do this using a blended service of strategy and innovative AI technologies to make an impact on the bottom line. This podcast is brought to you by 7-Step, a leading global workforce solutions provider that offers recruitment process outsourcing, MSP services to manage the flexible workforce, including suppliers and contractors, and total talent solutions for managing the entire permanent and flexible workforce supply. Their people are great, and so is their technology, particularly their Surveo Insights data and intelligence platform. It's really cutting edge, not only in how it brings your talent data together, but in how it draws deep, detailed, predictive intelligence. It's really like a crystal ball for your talent data. I used 7-Step at my previous two organizations, and their team helped us to launch a full-service RPO to staff healthcare workers, customer service reps, IT professionals, data science and engineering, digital design teams, along with aerospace engineers and manufacturing workers. Their talent analytics put data at my fingertips, which allowed me to see around corners and strategically plan for frequent and volatile market changes, including a global pandemic where we had to hire literally hundreds of thousands of people. Their deep knowledge and exceptional integrity allowed me to rely on them as a trusted partner across multiple lines of business. Go to 7stepRPO.com to learn more about the powerful things 7-Step can do for you. So talk to me a little bit about, like, um, how do we go about helping people to see the outcomes of the work? How do we design that work so that they can actually see the winners and losers so that it's not just incumbent on the, the functional leader or CEO or whatever you know, going around and just telling stories all day long, you know, in, uh, in, in, uh, which is still important. Don't get me wrong, but it's gotta be more than that. How do you go about designing the work to help impact, uh, impact, uh, the soul of the job? Yeah. I think there's a couple of elements to this, right? I think let's assume that we already have an organization, right? We're not starting with like a clean sheet of paper, which Right. Few leaders have the luxury of, right? They already are people, they're doing things, they have jobs, they're designed a certain way. I think the starting point, I think, is is you know to pick a specific area that produces a work product for a customer. Right. So let's take, you know, I don't know, like you're onboarding a new customer, right? The book that we wrote, Fixing Work, right, is the fictitious example of like an insurance company where, you know, Clients underwrite, you know, and then they got to be put on the systems, right? And so at the end of the day, you have like an onboarded customer. That would be the outcome. If you follow that, then you would say, okay, right, there is like one job to be done, right? Which is get the paperwork from the client and, and put it on the systems. Um, in today's environment, that work is oftentimes broken down into many, many different roles, right? The supervisors that check things, right? Things need to be scheduled and so forth. The starting point would be to say, is there a way that one person could do the entire job from start to finish? Mm-hmm. Or could we have a small team that does the entire job from start to finish? And if we can do that, then we can create like a little cell or team um, that then we can align, for example, to specific customers or to specific segments. So instead of, right, it's just work that comes at me and I'm just completing transactions, now I'm part of a team and we like own the patient, own the customer from start to finish, getting them through the process. And at the end of the day, we can actually get feedback from the customers to how we did it. So that's kind of like a different way of thinking about the work, right? So you, you basically put Humpty Dumpty back together, right? You take all these little bits and pieces and you say, right, can we make like one job from start to finish that delivers the work product? And that has immense benefits, right? For one, it's more efficient, right? You eliminate a lot of these departmental handoffs and, and alignment meetings and supports. 
Um, the second thing is the customers like it, right? Because then they have sort of a single point of contact that they're going to deal with, right? And it also addresses the, the feedback issue because now people can actually get feedback from the customer if you open up those channels, right? And they know whether they did a good job or not. Um, so I think those are some, some practical steps, right, that one would take. Um, one thing that oftentimes needs to happen as you do that work is really take a hard look at the workflow and say, do all these things that we do really add value, right? And, and really start to peel that apart and, and get rid of like all that busy work and transactional work that oftentimes gets in the way of completing the mission of the job. You know, that's that's rem uh, remarkably simple. Uh, but if anybody, uh, you know, on this uh, on on this, uh, you know, video has ever done that, which many of the listeners and viewers probably have, they realize that in the simplicity, it is very challenging. Right. You know, breaking, you know, we've we've spent mo so much time breaking down jobs that putting Humpty Dumpty back together again seems like an enormous task, right? You know, because we broke it down because maybe things weren't going as well and we wanted to create a functional competence, right? Um, say, oh, well, you know, why, why can't we just focus on this functional competence as opposed to, uh, and, you know, and how does, how does the functional competence really fit within your model, right? How does, like, because there's people who are actually delivering the service but then there's but then there's people that need to help right along the way you know that that can't be necessarily in the day-to-day -day delivery but have to uh be be uh inputting into those individuals so they stay on the cutting edge so they have the best technology so they have the capability to continually get better how does how does that work within your model I think there's a number of different ways you can address it. And actually, people already do it, right? Um, I do a lot of work in the pharma industry, right? Pharmaceutical drug development is project-based work, right? Yes, there are line functions, right, that have expertise in toxicology and clinical development and so forth, right? But the project is the customer. And so, right, they they are being pulled uh, to support the work of their team. So I think it's like a servant leadership model in that sense, right, might be the right way to think about that, right, is that really the job of these functions is to provide that knowledge and expertise to the groups that own the work product, right? And oftentimes, right, where we are today, oftentimes is like the, the functions like might like drive oftentimes right, what happens uh, on the workflow side and, and add all these extra layers to it. Um, and I think, again, that needs to be unpacked, right? But oftentimes, um, I, I think the other benefit that I think work design brings is because people own the entire job from start to finish. Uh, you get cross training, right? I remember doing this work with a with a specialty pharmacy. And so, you know, like when you're right when you're a hemophiliac and, and you know you get diagnosed and the doctor writes you a script. Right. So now you gotta mm. right, you gotta get the drug, you gotta get the infusion, you gotta get the, the benefits verified. Right? That oftentimes is broken down into different departments, right? So when you call in with the script, right, they kind of like, you know, put you into the little workflow and then maybe three or four weeks later, right, you get your, you get your infusion. Well, what we did is like, you know, we, we took these departments, we put these functional experts out, we put them into a cell that was aligned to, right, a specific geographic footprint. So now they're sitting next to each other. So the nurse, right, that has the conversation with the, with the patient and the benefits verification person, Right, short distances. Right, they know. Right, they know about this patient. They all sing like from the from the same sheet. Right, so I think that that mm -hmm. that learning that that gets people out of these functional silos, I think, is incredibly important. Getting people out of the functional silos and that learning is critical. And then, and then I think you made a great point that the people that have to provide functional support. They should be, you know, they should be doing so with the idea that the project team who's supporting the the customer, that is the ultimate customer here because they, you know, they have the voice of the customer uh, that they're relying on. So if you're, if you're getting IT support, HR support, you know, purchasing support, those are to be able to help the delivery to the ultimate customer, right? And, and I think that's where sometimes, like you said, our, our functional leaders you know, become a little bit uh, siloed in the sense that they and and insulated from the customer, and and maybe that's a great opportunity. I know, for example, Alan Lotvin in his meetings uh, where we would talk about ramp projects. I was invited 
to those meetings. And I would have to stand and report and I'd have, uh, I'd have challenges directly from other SVPs, uh, in those, uh, in those rooms about my, the robustness of my plans and, and how things would work. And we'd discuss problems and obstacles right there in the moment. I felt very in touch with who the customer was because I knew what, what the timelines were. I knew what the challenges I could, I heard the IT stuff that was going on. I didn't necessarily understand all of it in context, but I had enough framework that I felt like I knew my job was to support ramp and to support the PBM, right? And to, uh, and to support ultimately our customers who are sitting at the other end of this, who would be welcome to welcome season in January 1st and onward. So yeah, it's a, it's a different environment whenever you feel like you're connected to the customer. And then I could, I could convey that to my functional organization, you know, to say, Hey, this is how we support them. This is, this is what success looks like. And I didn't have to just say, well, success looks like hiring 10 people or a hundred people or a thousand people, right? I could say success looks like we hire this many because that's what it means to our business. And that's what it means to our customers. That's a different framing. And that's a, that's a, that's excellent. That's really insightful, Tom.